Our guest tonight uh, is probably the most closely followed figure <clears throat> in higher education today. And uh, I don't know why. Uh, he's, he's prone to mealy mouth comments like, there have been no innovations in learning since the printing press. Uh, his, his ambitions are cautious and modest, uh, such as, I aspire to educate a billion people around the world. So why everyone is paying such close attention is not clear to me. But I can uh, say that, uh, I, I can tell you that if you um, go home tonight and, uh, and uh, Google the now uh, uh, cliched and uh, 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 overused term MOOC, you'll find that it only appeared uh, about three or four years ago, according to my Lexus search. But as soon as it did, it began to be linked to our guest's name tonight. And rightly so, he can be seen as a founder of the um, uh, of the global online education movement, which is now, now afoot. Now, before his uh, current notoriety, he was already a superstar in, uh, in the world uh, in which we live. He's a graduate of the world-famous IIT in Madras, a Stanford PhD, and for several years has led the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or CSAIL, uh, at MIT. In Purdue's uh, uh, view, he, would already, he, was a, he is a triple threat uh, faculty member. He has won major awards for research, but also major awards for teaching. And on top of that, as, is heavily, as we would say, engaged. He is a serial entrepreneur. I think it's five companies and counting that he has started. I read in one article that he, uh, he uh, dates his entrepreneurial a career to his childhood in Mangalore, India, when he uh, made his first buck uh, uh, raising 40 chickens and um, selling their eggs. Uh, Anand, I want to tell you that if this moot gig doesn't work out too well, we have an excellent college of agriculture that <laughs> where we'd be happy to help you start on, a, on yet another career. Um, Dr. Agrawal founded edX, uh, the uh, and taught its very first course. Uh, there's an interesting anecdote in uh, the literature about him. Uh, they offered that course, not really knowing where this was all going, on his, uh, circuits and electronics. Uh, he's reported to have hoped that perhaps 2,000 students would sign up. As the number passed 100,000 students, on its way to an eventual 155,000 students, uh, he had one, I guess, one of those what have I done moments but the system didn't crash, and the course was successful, and the, and the MOOC movement was launched. I, Dr. Agarwal, uh, in, in a very gracious way, is challenging not just the mode of delivery that prevails in, or has prevailed in higher education, but uh, things even more fundamental. He has spoken about uh, his view that there will need to be change in, quote, stoved pipe single discipline departments. He's questioned why four years is uh, 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 meaningful in terms or necessary in terms of time to degree and implicitly has raised the question about the uh, how essential residential uh, education is. Um, when I somewhat playfully uh, talk about the pajamas test and show the slide I mocked up of, of a, a student uh, of the future sitting in his, uh, in his living room staring at a screen in his bathrobe uh, I'm worried that it's Dr. Agarwal on the other side of that screen. And uh, that's the challenge that he brings to us uh, here at Purdue and at schools like us everywhere. So uh, <clears throat> he wouldn't look at it this way, I know, but uh, it, to listen to some people talk about the threat, uh, the disruptive threat that uh, this gentleman and, and his protégés and imitators uh, generated, the, Tonight is a, would, would look a little like uh, I've invited uh, Alaric the Visigoth into the Roman Senate right before he sacked the place. But uh, I think you'll find out that's not his intent. And uh, you're, you're about to find out how, uh, what a true visionary uh, looks like. So uh, please welcome uh, enthusiastically Dr. Enant Agarwal. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Mitch. Uh, those were uh, extremely, uh, extremely kind words. 
And I promise you that uh, <clears throat> a lot of the questions that I ask in terms of the future of the university and so on are meant to, uh, are really meant to challenge us to think about, really meant to challenge us to think about a system that really hasn't changed in, uh, in a long time. And uh, I've, I've actually seen pictures from the earliest days of the photograph of classrooms with, uh, with the teacher teaching and uh, a whole bunch of students uh, sitting in rows, like neat little, uh, I drove from uh, Indianapolis airport to here and reminded me, you know, neat little rows like corn stalks right after, uh, right after a, a winter's thaw. And uh, but that, that system hasn't changed in uh, hundreds of years. Everything around us has changed. Healthcare has completely changed. Uh, in, a, in, in the space of a few hundred years, um, look at surgery. You know, a few hundred years ago, you'd be knocked on the head and they would uh, operate on you before you would come to, and, uh, and that, that's the best that they did. And today, with laparoscopic surgery, it's in and out. I mean, everything has changed around us. Uh, look at transportation. Uh, you know, you can, uh, with, with uh, jet engines and rockets, I mean, everything has changed. But our education hasn't changed. It is absolutely shocking that the same institutions where incredible research is done and, 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 and changing the world around us, we haven't changed ourselves. We haven't changed education. And so today, I want to give you a sense of uh, what is possible. And, uh, and really, the questions I ask are provocative questions. But fundamentally, edX came out of university. He's got a nonprofit. And we're looking to transform ourselves from within. And, and it asked these questions to see how can we improve and reinvent education. So this title is really about how do we rethink education? Can we do, can we do a lot better on a number of fronts? So what you see here, uh, this is not a uh, rock concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, this person here uh, you know, is not uh, Miley Cyrus uh, swinging on a uh, wrecking ball. <laughs> but uh, this is actually a teacher. And so this is actually a classroom at the uh, Obafemi Owolowo University in Nigeria. And, uh, and all of you have heard of uh, distance education, but if you look at the people <laughs> back here, <laughs> I would say they're undergoing long distance education. And if you think that what we're doing in MOOCs and online education is new, you know, talk to these people. When's the last time you know, they've had any personal contact with uh, the instructor? So our system is, uh, is, is uh, uh, you know, broken in terms of quality, I think in large parts of the world, we don't have access to uh, a good quality education uh, either. So edX is a nonprofit. We were formed uh, with a $60 million investment by MIT and Harvard. And uh, really, we came up with uh, a, uh, a three, parts to, uh, three parts to our mission. The first one is that uh, we wanted to increase access. Let me just check the. Uh... For some reason, the bottom of the screen is flipping off, but that's okay, no big deal. So we want to increase access to education for students all over the world. A second big part of our mission was to improve research, um, is to create research and learn about learning. And third was to improve campus education. So really understand how we can improve campus education. So this is our website. So if you go to edX.org, edX.org, I encourage you to go out there. Uh, you can take some of these courses from, uh, from uh, some of the great universities of the world. The course highlighted here is uh, a course on financial analysis and decision making from Tsinghua. Tsinghua is among the top two universities in China. Uh, they are a partner of ours. And so you can go and take these online courses from uh, just great universities in the world, and, and the courses are free. And we'll talk more about these, uh, these courses. So one reason why MOOCs, these massive open online courses, really caught the attention of, uh, of the world was th the sheer numbers and scale at which education could be offered. So for example, in the first course on edX that my colleagues and I taught, we had uh, 155,000 students sign up to take the course. Now, uh, this is a big number, certainly for MIT. It's not a big number for Purdue. Here, I hear you have 30,000 undergraduates. How do you say, wow, that's, it, it, it boggles my mind. MIT has, uh, anyone want to take a shout? How, how many undergraduates do you think MIT has? 5,000. Good guess, 4,500. 30,000, how do you, how do you, that's incredible. So uh, MIT is 4,500. 4, so this, the joke I'm about to crack, you know, won't, won't make a lot of sense to you. But, uh, but, but this number here, 155,000, is actually bigger than the total number of alumni of MIT in its 150-year history. 
Now, now at, at Purdue, you will blow past that number. So if it's four years and you have 30,000 students, then you'll blow past that number in about uh, 16 years. OK, about uh, 150 years, then uh, this, this number is bigger. So it really caught the attention of at least uh, some people. So 155,000 uh, students signed up for the course. And uh, at the end, uh, this was an MIT hard course. We advertised the fact that this had differential equations as prerequisites. It's a course on circuits and electronics. It's a really hard course. And 7,200 students uh, passed the course. And uh, these were from 162 countries. This is also a big number. And this is a big number because if I were to teach at MIT, I teach about 100 students each semester. I teach it twice a semester. And I've been teaching at MIT for 26 years. Uh, but to teach this many students, I would have to teach, for, to teach at MIT for 40 years. And in one fell swoop, you, know, you get a large number of students. So the access part is a really big aspect of uh, these MOOCs. So to give you a quick sense of uh, edX, so today, uh, so we started about two years ago. And uh, today we have 2.2 uh, million students from all over the world. Uh, they come from 196 countries. And uh, that is all the countries in the world. We have uh, 4 million enrollments, which means that on average students are taking two courses. So this many courses have been taken. And we have courses in virtually all subjects, in music, in arts, history, engineering, computer science, business, math, um, you know, the name it, and there are courses in those areas. Um, we also uh, work with a number of university partners. So we have about uh, close to 50 university partners on our platform. And we also work with a lot of campuses where, where universities put up a course online and make it freely available to students around the world. It's completely online. And I'll give you a sense of what an online course looks like. And then they also bring it back to campus and create a blended model class where they combine in person with uh, online. And uh, so we have uh, over 12,000 12, students that are taking these blended model classes across a number of campuses uh, all over the world. So here are some of our partners. So we work with, uh, with uh, great universities of the world. Uh, uh, we're actually uh, uh, according Purdue, and we would love to get Purdue to join edX as well as a partner, and, uh, and uh, you know, join other universities such as uh, Cornell, uh, you know, of course MIT and Harvard, Berkeley, uh, Tsinghua from China, IIT Bombay, uh, Louvain from Belgium, uh, there's the Australian National University from Australia, so many universities all over the world that offer courses on our platform. So even as we offer courses, students can take these courses for free. So I forgot to mention that, these courses are free. So you can take these great courses for free. And so students can audit the course. Um, and they just audit the course for free. Uh, they can also sign up to take an honor code certificate where if they pass the course, they get a nice little certificate that looks like this. This is a course from Berkeley. We've also launched verified certificates where we use a webcam to take the picture and a picture of their photo ID and make sure that they are who they say they are, uh, the name and the face match, the photo ID. And you can get a verified certificate. Then we charge a small fee for a verified certificate service, uh, $25, $50, something like that. And that becomes a uh, revenue source for edX. I mentioned we are a nonprofit. Uh, nonprofit does not mean money losing. So I want to be very clear. Okay, nonprofit does not mean slothful. Nonprofit does not mean big government. Nonprofit does not mean non innovative. Nonprofit does not mean slow moving. So somehow there's all of these things. Uh, uh, applied to nonprofits, but but uh, I've done a number of startup companies. So I, I only know how to run uh, run fast and startups, and so we're running edX like a startup company, but it's nonprofit. So edX it does happen to be my first uh, nonprofit, and so uh, we are looking at various approaches to generating revenue. And our goal is to make sure that outflow matches input. Uh, we're not looking to do an IPO or or uh, you know get huge uh, you know uh, huge profits and so on. We want to break even, and that's our goal as a, uh, as a nonprofit. So this is one revenue source that, that we have, and, and we share this revenue 50-50 uh, with our university partners so that as they invest in courses, uh, they also get some uh, money back so they can invest in, uh, in campus education and uh, for online courses. So one of the things that edX did, so there are, edX is the only nonprofit uh, uh, MOOC uh, provider. Uh, there are also uh, for-profit MOOC providers. Um, one of the things that edX has done uniquely is we've also made a platform available as open source software. So that open source is called OpenEdX. 
In other words, uh, anybody can take our platform, our software, and they can go off and build their own, uh, own uh, MOOC platform or, or system or whatever. And if they want, they can compete with edX. Again, we're a nonprofit. We're looking to foster collaboration around the world, and we made a platform available as well. So as an example, we, we made a platform open source and made it freely available to anybody six months ago, and there's been huge adoption of that uh, uh, all over the world. So as an example, uh, uh, Tsinghua and the Chinese Ministry of Education launched Shuetongx, which is a Chinese national platform. France launched a national platform in, um, in, in France. Uh, uh, Stanford uh, also have, has, have, has now adopted uh, open edX, and the Stanford platform called class.stanford.edu uses edX now. Stanford Online uses edX. Um, this is uh, uh, France, and also uh, this is uh, cut off here, but uh, Queen Rania from the Middle East launched Edrock, which is a Middle East uh, Arabic uh, platform using, using Open edX. We're also working with uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, they launched, uh, these are the Davos people, they launched Forum Academy, also using working with edX as a partner. So but one of the things that I do want to talk about is, uh, is uh, for those of you who've uh, read some of these things in the paper, uh, recently, there's been some angst about uh, what about the low completion rates. So for the course that I taught, I showed you the numbers. 155,000 signed up, 7,200 passed the course. So if you look at that as a completion rate, that's about 5%. So people are saying, oh my god, this is terrible. You know, it's 5% completion rates. Uh, so therefore, MOOCs must be terrible. And so I just want to point out that uh, uh, really looking at completion rates as a percentage of those people that sign up it doesn't make any sense. And I'll give you a quick, uh, give you a quick example uh, why. So we really need to put these certification, certification rates in context. So let's take, for example, a course from uh, any selective university. Right? Uh, let's, let's, uh, I'll use my own example. At MIT, for example, uh, uh, the, the course that I taught was the same rigor as the campus course that I teach. And uh, notice that about, uh, typically about 7% of learners pass uh, uh, these edX courses. For the course that I taught, 5% passed uh, the course. But remember, anybody can take an edX course. You can go to edX, no matter what your background is, and I encourage you to do so, and you can sign up to take a course. There is no admissions test. So part of our goal is to democratize education. It doesn't matter if you have the background. It doesn't matter if you have the money. It doesn't matter what your race is, your color, your geography. Really, nothing matters. You need, all you need to be happy you know, is, is an internet connection and be able to uh, you know, click and, and sign up to take a course for free. There is no admissions test. So 7% so, uh, so, uh, so pass the course, but anybody can come in in a completely democratic fashion and take the course. So, so that's 7%. But then if you look at MIT's admissions rate, uh, MIT announced the admission rate this year. And this year, MIT admitted 7% of people that uh, applied to MIT. So 20,000 applied, and they made admission offers to 1,400 students this year. So then why is the press surprised that 7% pass the course and 7% uh, get admitted to MIT? So it's, it's not surprising that those numbers are similar. And so you just have to put this in, uh, put this in perspective. The other way to look at it is that uh, uh, if you look at students, uh, we, we also did some studies to see how many pass the course. So for those who audit, who just sign up to audit the course, so when you audit the course, you're saying, look, I just want to listen. I'm, I'm not looking to uh, get a certificate. And 5% pass the course if they declare they're an auditor. So about 70, 75% uh, of the people who sign up are auditors. For those who sign up for an honor code certificate, that is also free. Again, you know, 5% uh, pass the honor code uh, certificate. But those that pay a small fee, that's 25 bucks or 50 bucks, and sign up for a verified certificate, 60% pass. This means that those that even pay a small amount of money indicating seriousness about completing the course, well, they pass at 60%. So therefore, when, when people go to university, they are, they've gone through an admissions test, they are paying tuition, no matter whether it's high or low, they're paying some tuition, and, and the pass rates are pretty high. So and, and this pass rate certainly is consistent with the pass rates in many courses at universities. So what does an online course, uh, what does an online course look like? So this is uh, a uh, artificial intelligence course from UC Berkeley. And uh, notice this uh, little uh, icon here. So in a typical course on campus, you have a lecture. What we do is we replace lectures with what we call learning sequences. A learning sequence is a sequence of short videos, five, 10-minute videos, 
interleave with uh, interactive exercises. So uh, you may watch a video, and following a video, you may, we may ask you a simple problem or a hard problem, and you go and answer the problem. So really, you interact with videos, and then you, then you uh, do some exercises and so on. And so here's the video. There's a transcript next to the video, so you can follow along if you like with the transcript, and uh, do these interactive exercises uh, between videos and interactive exercises. And uh, this, this form of learning, where you, you watch a video and then interact and try to answer a question, is a form of learning that is called active learning. And education researchers have known this for a long time, uh, just that we have never listened to them. Right? So, uh, so, it's, so a lot of what MOOCs are doing is just not new. We just found a way to apply what learning researchers have known for decades, and finally we are listening to them and applying it and changing the way university thinks. So uh, what they found in this uh, landmark paper by Crack and Lockhart in 72, that learning and retention relates to how deeply you process the material. So if you sit and just listen to a lecture, you're going to forget. But uh, if you use a Socratic method, you, know, you, you, you teach by asking questions, get the students to engage, they will, uh, st studies have proven that it lasts a much, much longer time. And so on edX, mechanically, by making sure that we have these uh, videos interleaved with exercises and, and having professors do that really promotes this form of learning. The other thing with videos, uh, I was in a, uh, I was in uh, uh, one of uh, your classrooms today, and uh, you know, I sat down with a number of students. And, uh, and that class was a blended class where students, uh, uh, they've replaced the lecture with, uh, with having students watch videos before they come to class. And then in class, they have discussions and, and projects and so on. And, and I asked the students, you know, what did they like? They really asked them how many of them liked the lecture format versus this blended format. So remember, what I'm showing here is a purely online version. You can also have a blended uh, version in class, where in, in, a, in a classroom setting on campus, you can blend online with the best of in-person. That's called a blended model. And I asked them, what did they like about the videos uh, and, and the blended class versus a traditional lecture class? And one thing they all said was the flexibility. That in a classroom, uh, if you're like me, um, I remember you know, most of my classes, around the fifth minute mark, I would lose the professor. And I would be sitting there scrambling, writing notes. I suspect many of you have had similar experiences. And while all the students around me were perfectly capable of understanding what's going on, but I lost, I would lose them around five minutes. And then I would just be scrambling. But here, you can pause the video of the professor. You can rewind it. Heck, you can even mute the professor. <laughs> and in fact, in the blended model class that I taught at MIT, I took a poll. It turned out that two thirds of the students were actually muting me and reading the transcript on the side. So it's, it's very flexible. Different people like to learn in different ways. And, and the video gives just a lot of flexibility to learning. So one question people ask is, uh, so how do, you, how do you grade? If you have 100,000 students in your class, how do you grade these classes? How do you, th there's no way you can sit down and do it in paper. So we use computing technology to do all of that stuff. So, so here's an example. I'll show you a quick little video where you, uh, you're asked, it's a chemistry class. You're asked a question. And uh, we can assess all of these things by computer. So a student will enter a, an equation, and we'll have a computer check it and give them instant feedback. OK, so let's take a look at a quick little video. So a student enters an answer. It's a chemical equation. And oops, they're going to get it wrong. OK, they check it, and they get it wrong again. And then finally, they get it right and get a little green check mark to say they got it right. So this, so this is an example of instant feedback where, where you know, most of us remember in classes where you submit a homework and get something back a week later, but here you get uh, a quick instant feedback, and you can fix things if, if something was slightly wrong. And, and students absolutely love this. And they're telling us that uh, this green, little green check mark has become somewhat of a cult symbol at edX. The students are telling us that they go to bed at night dreaming, dreaming of the green check mark. <laughs> and in fact, uh, the green check mark uh, uh, has reached the meme status on the web. So we actually <laughs> discovered this on the web. Uh, uh, someone posted a meme on the green uh, check mark. So you know, you know as, a, as a technologist, you know you've arrived when people have begun to meme, uh, meme what you've done. So the green check mark has become quite, uh, quite uh, heroic. So the other thing that we do is, how do you do labs online? So we have online laboratories. And here, uh, uh, Purdue is, 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 uh, is quite a leader in this space uh, in some of the work that Purdue is doing with NanoHub, uh, 
uh, and so on, um, really for looking at how do you do online labs and how do you do online inter in interactives uh, completely online. And so we have uh, quite a bit of that. We focused quite a bit on that as well to bring much more of a gamification experience to students. So I'll show you a little lab here. So this is from the Science of Cooking course from Harvard. And so here you'll see uh, students are going to cook, uh, cook some meat. They're going to select uh, what kind of meat, tuna, steak, uh, choose the thickness, uh, how long the cooker on each side. And then you'll see it cooking. And, uh, and don't uh, miss the sound effect, which you will hear. And then they can go around and play around with a piece of meat and see you know, what's the temperature profile and, and, and a whole bunch of things. This is one example of a simulation lab for cooking. So the student picks the meat, uh, picks the, uh, the type of uh, the thickness and so on. <laughs> and that's a grilling taking place. <laughs> and then here, they, so here they check the temperature profile and so on and so forth. And, uh, and uh, it really just brings a gamified experience into the whole, uh, into, the, into, the, into, the, into the course. So that's kind of the, the whole access story and, and the, the online components of what we have. We also have a social component where you have a discussion forum where students can ask questions on the discussion forum and uh, students are answering each other's questions and, and really rather than, than getting rid of uh, iPhones and iPads from the classroom, we embrace the social and bring the discussion into uh, the online experience and uh, that is also really engaging the students. In fact, uh, there's a study by Lori Breslau, who's a researcher at MIT, and, uh, uh, and what she found was that a student passing a course in the success rate was very highly correlated with the student uh, collaborating and working with somebody else. And so the social can be a big part of the online experience. Uh, next up, uh, let me talk a bit, little bit about uh, the blended model of learning where you can bring online back to campus and combine the online with in-person. And this is how we think we can improve the whole campus experience. And, and here again, uh, I was really delighted. I, I, I visited a couple of classrooms today. I was really delighted that uh, there's a lot of work going on at Purdue in the blended model already. So, uh, so I went to a digital design class uh, this afternoon, that uh, it's EE290, I believe. And there, uh, uh, what the professor had done was uh, uh, the students were asked to watch videos and, and so on before class. And they would come to class, and the professor would cover any topics that had been particularly hard for the students. They spend maybe five, 10 minutes on the lecture. And then for the, uh, there's no lecture as such, and for the remaining 40 minutes or whatever, uh, students would be given uh, problems, and they're all sitting around in small tables in small groups. It, it's not like uh, you know, condros, but small tables sitting around in little groups and collaborating with each other, solving the problems, and, uh, and working together in a group. You're learning all those great soft skills. How do you collaborate? How do you interact with each other? How do you solve problems together? And so, uh, and really engage with the material. So I, I really see that as the future of learning. We haven't quite figured out what the right blend between online and in-person is. So here's an example. So uh, about, uh, when we started out about a year and a half ago, uh, we did a blended model experiment with uh, San Jose State University. And we, the two experiments that happened simultaneously, one is uh, to use a blended model in a classroom where students would watch the videos. And in this particular case, they were using the edX platform on campus. And so they would also watch the videos. And they would also do a lot of interactive exercises and online labs that I showed you before they came to class. And then, so this is a picture from the real classroom. They would come to class, and they would work in small groups and do problem-solving exercises together. And the second experiment they did here was to see if the online content that the students watched, if that, how would it help if that came not from the local university, but came from somebody else? It's like a textbook. Uh, we're all comfortable using a textbook from somebody else, so why not use a new age textbook? Why not use a multimedia interactive online content, uh, much like a textbook, uh, and use that in your class. And in fact, many textbook vendors are now talking to edX and, and also looking at doing this themselves, where they want to turn the textbooks into multimedia experiences. And so selling a $100 textbook to you, they'll sell you a multimedia experience for 100 bucks or, or whatever else. Uh, in this case, it's free, but you know, uh, for, for some fee. And, and the professor in the classroom then has to decide uh, you know, how do they pass the pajama test? I really like the pajama test. I'm going to keep, I'm, I'm going to keep using that. So, so as, a, as we all have to decide, how do we pass the pajama test? If I can get a multimedia textbook, like a content like this, you know, uh, very cheaply, and it's much better than a flat textbook, 
So as a professor, how do I pass the pajama test? In other words, what value add do I provide? What value add do I provide as a university to those students who are paying and coming to campus? And so I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves. I think there is value add, and, uh, but, but uh, you know, we need to really think hard about what is that value add? Can we focus on the value add? And so in this class, they collaborated and so on, and, and the results were just staggeringly good. So here, traditionally, uh, that course was a circuits course had a failure rate of roughly 40%. So for about 10 years, this is a standard course that is offered, the failure rate was 40%. But when they moved to this blended model class, the failure rate fell to 9%. I have not seen such, a, such an amazing result uh, in, in education in a long time. And then they repeated the experiment. Uh, this was in fall of 2012. They repeated this spring of 13, and then again in fall of 13. And they're doing it again in spring of 14. And the results have just kept getting better. In the most recent experiments, only 2% failed. And so now this experiment has spread to the entire California State University system, and the course is being used in a number of campus, campuses across the system. And we'll see how that, uh, how that continues to, uh, uh, to progress. We're also working with community colleges. So this is the uh, picture from the Bunker Hill Community College, where uh, uh, they use the course, uh, a computer science course. Uh, this is Professor Jamie LaRue. So, so one worry that's already creeping up in your minds is that if I get this incredible interactive course, then what am I, as a teacher, what am I, Jamie LaRue, going to be doing in class? Am I even needed? Am I going to be completely disenfranchised? Can students just take a pure online course and, and not need a teacher on the ground anymore? And, and, and these worries are creeping up and people are getting worried. So for things like this, I would again ask people to talk to people like Jamie LaRue, who've done this now. Talk to Professor Kosser Gadiri from San Jose State as to what, what is the value the professor is bringing. And there's huge value the campus and the professor is bringing. So here's a quote from uh, Jamie LaRue. So on being replaced, you know, by, uh, are we using computers to replace teachers? No. She argues that if not for her presence in the classroom, helping the students work together, uh, she's not lecturing anymore, but working with the students with this online content, uh, much like you're doing in Purdue already, where the, the instructor, uh, as I went to the class today, the instructor was uh, walking around, asking the students questions, answering hard issues and questions, and much more dynamic. There was a buzz in the class. I mean, the students were excited. There was this real, I could feel the buzz. I mean, usually you go to a classroom, what do you see? You see everybody asleep, or if they've shown up to class, that is, uh, you know, uh, asleep or on Facebook. But here, there's a buzz. They're all interactive, engaged, and talking. I mean, it's, it's incredible, I amazing energy. And so she said, if not for the, uh, her presence in the classroom, uh, you know, the students would not have, uh, would not have passed the course. Uh, at MIT, they've really gone into a big way into blended learning, uh, as, as uh, Purdue is getting in, uh, in a big way as well. And at MIT, the space of uh, one and a half years, 23 classes on campus were turned into MOOCs, offered for free, and the same content is being used in classrooms. At MIT, two out of three students are now accessing edX and using blended model on campus. Two out of three. And they're turned on a dime in the space of one and a half, the first course was a year and a half ago blended uh, using uh, the online content from a MOOC. And within the space of a year and a half, 2,800 students are using the content uh, on campus. And there's a lot of good results. Uh, I won't go into a lot of the details. Uh, this is a blended classroom at Tsinghua University in China. So, th so this, this effort is spreading. So in China, uh, this looks very much like your class at, in uh, EE290 in Purdue. Uh, lots of round tables. Look at this class. I mean, this doesn't look like a, this looks like a bazaar. It doesn't look like a classroom anymore. Where are the constructs? It doesn't look like a drive from you know, Indianapolis Airport to Lafayette. I mean, this looks like this is fun. Students want to show up to class. I mean, they're engaged. You know, the, the, a, an instructor is describing some hard concept. What they've done is the blackboard here, the blackboard here, a green board. They've got, they've got boards all around the classroom and little round tables, and students kind of are working together in groups. Well, very, very much like what you have uh, at Purdue. So this is really how uh, one aspect of how the future might unfold. Finally, I want to show you some uh, fun results. Uh, this is my last slide. So I mentioned uh, we have three parts to our mission at edX as a nonprofit. One is increase access to education, where I really believe that, uh, that everyone, anywhere in the world, should have access to a high quality education, much like the air we breathe. That's access. Second is how do we improve campus education based on what we learn? And the blended model classroom is one example. The third is research. We are using the data that we collect on edX along with the partner universities, to research how we can do education better. 
So think of edX with the, with the, so with the first course that we taught, uh, you won't believe it, but we had quarter of a billion data records. We, we track every mouse click, we track every piece of data. And Google does it, but in Google's case, they're doing it to maximize you know, profits and eyeballs and you know, uh, how do we get more revenues. But edX, we use the same kind of data and we gather everything to improve learning. And I like to call edX the particle accelerator for learning just for that reason. So I'll give you one example. So one question we've always asked, how long should videos be? Should videos be one hour long like a lectures? Or heavens forbid, an hour and 30 minutes like some lectures? Or should they be one minute long? I and mean, who knows what the right number is? So Philip Gore did this uh, a study at uh, looking at all the video lengths over a number of courses, a number of subjects, number of universities at edX. And here was his finding. And again, all of this data was mined. This is the big data for learning. And he plotted on the y-axis the amount of time a student spent on a video. And on the x-axis, he plotted the length of the video. And from uh, three minutes to six minutes to nine minutes to uh, one hour, okay, length of the videos. And here where he plotted the engagement with the, how long did the student watch the video. And what he found was six minutes is the ideal video length. Students watched a six minute video for almost six, for, for six minutes. But once he got to a video that was an hour long, Students watched it for barely three minutes. So, uh, so this really goes to show that after you show something to a student for about six minutes, it behooves you to really have some exercise. And what's interesting is the red curve is all the students, uh, the, you know, hundreds of thousands of students who've signed up for the course. But then I, then I told the researcher, yeah, but you know, a lot of the students were not really interested. What about those that got a certificate? Maybe those that got a certificate and passed the course really watched the videos completely and they really engaged with the videos. But, but, but the blue curve is for the students that earn certificates. The same trend applies. Look at this. Even those that got certificates watched it for six minutes and then uh, they didn't watch the longer videos for much longer than they watched than the others did. In fact, they watched one hour videos for three, for three minutes, they watched it for four minutes. Okay, so. 30, 33% improvement, <laughs> but still four minutes. And so, uh, so this is just one example of a result, of the kind of results we can get. And our hope is that as we collect this huge amount of data, we can mine the data for good. Okay, we can use this data, uh, unlike a for-profit, we can use this to really study it and understand how people learn, how students learn, and in, in a very short amount of time, maybe discover really new ways in which people learn and really improve learning uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you. One, let me, let me ask uh, a one or two to get us started. Uh, update us on one thing. Uh, uh, the, um, some of the early uh, reports I saw indicated that of the completers, or those who were uh, earning the certificates, degrees, or, or at least passing the final, um, they tended uh, to be um, uh, all people who were already well-educated. These were people pursuing uh, continuing education, let's say. Uh, to a greater extent. Has that begun to change as edX has, continu has continued and grown? Uh, because uh, for those of us who were thrilled at the idea of a democratization of education, uh, it looked as though at least early on uh, what you had was uh, principally people uh, who were already ahead of the education game getting further ahead. So uh, let me describe uh, some of the statistics and, uh, and describe the rationale. So right now um, on edX, um, if you look at the statistics for, for the course that I showed you, the circuits course, 5% uh, of the learners were uh, younger than 18. So 5% were high schoolers, and uh, our youngest learner is eight years old. <laughs> so high schoolers and elementary schoolers. Um, that's 5%. 45% uh, are between the ages of 18 and 25. And so you could think of them as uh, college age or master's students uh, who haven't really completed a degree. So 45% are in that category. And 50% are above the age of 25. And so you can say that, uh, so around, you know, what we've seen is around two-thirds of our students already have a degree. But one-third 
uh, you know, are in college or younger. So if you have the two million learners, and so a third of two million are college age or high school age. And so that's a big number. Yeah. But that said, two thirds, a significant fraction, two thirds already have a degree. Now, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, certainly in terms of democratizing education, I would like to see more students who uh, do not necessarily have a degree who are taking this to, to learn stuff. And there's really, I think, two, uh, two impediments to that. One is uh, just simply our fault. Uh, so I've talked to many students uh, who are taking edX courses, and I talked to uh, a student at UT Austin. And he took two edX courses, and he did not get a certificate in either course. So I asked him, why did you get a certificate? You know, what happened to you? He said, well, you know, first of all, your courses are offered in spring and fall. So our universities are our partners, and our university partners and professors are used to creating courses in spring and fall. And so that's <coughs> what we did, spring and fall courses. And when the semester's running in spring and fall, students are already taking, at, at Purdue, I took a poll in the class I was in. Um, several students that I talked to were taking six courses already. And so this student in UT Austin was taking six courses too. And he said, I took on two more edX courses. And when, and when his, the midterms for his campus courses began, he said he just couldn't keep up with the two extra edX courses. And so he uh, stopped out of those two courses. And so, and so many of the students who, are, who don't have a degree are already learning and studying. And they can't take on even more than they are doing today. And so how are we fixing that? Well, we are encouraging our university partners to offer courses in summer. So that's one example. The second is that uh, we give certificates, but we need to, uh, our universities need to come around to saying, we need to give some campus credit for students who have taken a MOOC course. That's something for you to, for you to think about is, uh, let's say, for example, Purdue offers an online course. And uh, if you have a student uh, in high school who's taken uh, a, a EE290, a digital design course on, from Purdue, offered by a Purdue instructor online, and they've aced the course, and they come to Purdue, and uh, they come to campus in the second year, and they come and tell you, look, I've already aced this course. Are you going to make me take the same course again? Or can you give me credit for the course I've taken online? And today, universities are, have to answer these hard questions. MIT has to answer this almost immediately, because uh, um, the Batushig, who's a student, 15-year student from Mongolia, he came, you know, he took an edX course, he took my course, he aced it, he got 100 in this hard course. And he applied to MIT, and he got into MIT at, at 15. And his acing the course had something to do with it, I think. And so he's not at MIT. So next year, going to, next year, he'll have to take my course as a required course. And I can see him coming to me and saying, do you really want me to take this course again? I've aced it. And you know, we will have to answer these hard questions. You know, what do we do about credit? I love those stories. And by now, you must have a number of them where uh, MIT, maybe some of your other partners, are finding students, in, using this as a, a way to find students. Uh, I read a, about an Indian student, I believe, in some fairly small community that would never have found his way to MIT before, but MIT found him, I think, because of the, uh, Absolutely. the success he had. There are a lot of amazing stories like this where students, uh, whether they're young kids in high school uh, who are able to uh, get to uh, a university that they couldn't otherwise have. And many universities, like you know, in Australia, for example, are using edX. Uh, not only to think about education, how to improve campus education, but also as a way of brand promotion, to, to propagate the brand around the world, and, uh, and to seek out uh, great students who are taking their courses, and to do really well in their courses, seek them out and get them to come on campus. And so uh, that is one of the, uh, something we haven't planned for, but many universities are thinking about it uh, in that manner. And, we, we, and we're seeing a lot of stories of students that take these MOOC courses, they like the professor, like the way the thing is taught, they find a match, and they go to the university where uh, that course is from. There was a lot of speculation, and, and, and you've experimented, I believe, with uh, linking with, directly with employers to certificate students who pass a, uh, a course of direct relevance to a given uh, business or industry. And I think one of your, you recently discontinued one of your ventures in that way, but it's still an intriguing concept that uh, using your technology and your approach, uh, you could prove to the full confidence of a potential employer, uh, someone's readiness. Absolutely. I think uh, uh, the uh, students take these courses. And uh, I'll tell you the story of one student. Um, he's from New York. Uh, and uh, it's a true story. So I, I, I won't tell you the name of the student or the company. Um, and so, uh, so this student uh, uh, took uh, a, uh, the software as a service course offered by Professor Armando Fox from Berkeley. and. Uh, 
He got a certificate in the software as a service course. And then he posted that, res that certificate on his LinkedIn profile. He just posted it there. He got an interview with, uh, he got an interview with the company in New York. Uh, it's a huge media company, uh, you can, uh, gigantic media company. And he got an interview with that company. And a week later, he got the job and on, on the strength of that course. And now he's working at that company. And there are many, many stories of, uh, of students who, uh, who are uh, doing this kind of thing. We just, at edX, we had an experiment that, uh, uh, that Mitch, you alluded to, um, having to do with, uh, so we said, oh, this is a good idea. Uh, maybe it's a revenue model for edX. Let's connect students who do well in the course to employers. And we discontinued the pilot because it did not work out too well because we were working with HR departments. And HR departments are used to looking for degrees and traditional credentials. Uh -huh. And they had no way of, of measuring and judging non-traditional credentials and certificates. Now, the heck, they hadn't even heard of MOOCs. And so, uh, and so, uh, so we felt that it, it, it was going to be a long road as we educated uh, people about the value of these things. And so we said this wasn't a short-term thing. We would have to turn ourselves into an HR company. And so we <laughs> said, uh, you know, let's stick to our knitting, and we discontinued the pilot. Audience questions? Please. So the question, in case you didn't hear it, was uh, in the blended model, students are on campus and they work together and they discuss things with each other in the classroom. And the, the question is, can you do that online by having students do the same thing in a virtual uh, online chat room? And the answer is yes. And uh, uh, Google was building their own online platform when edX open sourced. Uh, they've now uh, adopted the open edX platform and they're collaborating with us. So as part of that, uh, how many of you, uh, let's see a show of hands, uh, how many of you have used Google Hangouts. So Google Hangouts is a virtual chat room with video and, and so on. And so Google integrated Instant Hangouts into edX. So if you go into, uh, uh, we have a demo course on edX. I encourage you to go to uh, edX.org, sign up, and, and, and check out the Demo 101 course. And as part of that, uh, at one point in the course, there's an Instant Hangout. You click on the Instant Hangout button, and boom, you're thrown into an, a virtual chat room they can have a chat session and discuss some things with a few of the students. So good idea, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's something we are experimenting with. Thank you. The question was, uh, in the past quarter alone, quarter of a billion dollars have been invested in education. And so what's your sense? Why is this so and so on? So first of all, I think it's fantastic. When's the last time you've seen for-profit industry putting money into education? Education used to be a loss leader. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've been quoted as saying that we, we celebrate you know, uh, tall men and women that can take this spherical object and dunk it in another spherical device. And, and we turn them into heroes and pay them 20 million bucks and so on. Uh, you know, uh, why can't we celebrate teachers? And so now money is going into education, and, and education is hot, and it's fantastic. I think it's a good thing. And so uh, the question was, uh, why are you set up as a, uh, as a uh, nonprofit? Um, I really think that uh, the for-profits have really picked it up, and they're smelling money. And uh, uh, it's easy to make money in education. You know, if Purdue wanted to. Uh, you know, make tons of money. It's, it's not hard to make money, it, it, but there's a mission. Uh, there's a mission aspect to it, which is education is a basic human right. And, and to do it right, and, and the mission aspect, it really has to be a nonprofit. And we felt that what we're doing is transformative. It is going to be disruptive. And, and we felt very strongly, and despite my own for-profit roots, strong for-profit roots, and I come from a strong business community in India, that, you know, uh, that making money is like religion. But we felt that you know, uh, non-profit was the way to go because this is really, really disruptive. And we wanted uh, to be sure that our board and us, we made decisions you know, based on principle, not profit. And, and, and I, can, I can give you example after example after example of decisions we've made that, we would have, that I would have made differently had we been a for-profit. I'll give you an example. A year, year into edX, we made our platform open source. 
which means we gave away our platform for free. And giving things away from free is not something for profits do. We are the only MOOC provider that has given away our platform for free because it's the right thing to do. So we do things based on it is right, you know, not that uh, it's going to make a lot of money. And so that's just one example of a decision. And, and I can give you a number of decisions. Another example where we really ask the universities to create rigorous courses that, that are match the rigor of campus courses. Now that, that, lowers, uh, uh, that lowers pass rates. That's not good for MOOCs. So if you look at the for-profit providers, uh, they, they will be talking to universities about dumbing down the courses, about watering down the courses, making it easier, upping the pass rate. But edX, we say, no, <laughs> we want to be focusing on quality education. You know, forget the eyeballs. Let's, let's be, be getting the eyeballs nonetheless, but let's focus on quality. And eventually, you know, we will get there, but let's do the right thing. So I can give you decision upon decision that are made differently you know, as a nonprofit. And it, it's not surprising that in the US, virtually every university is a nonprofit. And, and, the, and, and, and the two or three universities, I won't, I won't name them, uh, you know, that are for profit, you know, uh, I'll let you think about the reputation. Can someone name a for profit university in the US? Phoenix University. You said it. Yeah. yeah. So now, let me pursue that question one a short step further. There was a very interesting uh, pair of announcements, I, I think maybe on the same day or at least in proximity recently, in which you <coughs> folks hired a, a well-regarded woman with, whose background is in for-profit, a uh, very successful uh, 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 leader of a for-profit entity. And on the same day, I believe, uh, Coursera, maybe the most prominent for-profit MOOC, uh, entrant, hired Richard Levin, the former president of Yale University. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's a little blending going on there too, or how would you describe that? Hey, I, I think it is quite interesting, and, uh, 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 and I'll speak for edX, where you know, we are a nonprofit, and so you know, universities trust us, I think we're a nonprofit. I think we're, we are very similar to universities, and uh, there's no, we, we're not viewed as a threat, you know, we are very collaborative. Uh, we're not VC-backed. We have an academic board for better, better, or for worse. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, it's run by academics. Although in my case, you know, the, the, uh, the press and others view me as an academic. Little do they know I'm a serial entrepreneur. But that said, we're viewed as academic. Um, so we brought in Wendy Sabula to, uh, as, a, as president and COO of edX, and I'm the CEO of edX. And the reason is that uh, she's going to run uh, internal execution. And we want to be, uh, uh, we really believe in a very efficient execution and, uh, and we want to be sustainable and we really use very good business practices and so that's why we brought in uh, Wendy. Uh, and I'll let you think about why a for-profit had to bring, bring in an academic to run the organization. Uh, you know, uh, I'll let you think about why they had to do that. Couple, we have time just for one or two more, uh, Andy. There have been studies, and edX, we are interested in doing studies ourselves, and uh, many, many, many studies have already been done, I'm not answering the question yet, comparing the blended to the uh, pure on-campus version. Many, many studies. And, and the reason we have many more studies of the blended is that on campus, it is natural to offer a blended course. I'm waiting for a campus to offer a pure online course on campus so we can compare it to the blended version, because frankly, I do believe that the purely online version is only going to be slightly worse than the blended version, while the traditional campus course is going to be significantly poorer in quality to the blended version. However, uh, no campus has done that, um, and, and frankly, part of it is, I think, a fear. That if, as a campus, first of all, as a campus, uh, the academic committees don't allow a purely online course. They're saying, oh, if it's a purely online course, then what are we doing as a university? And so it's been hard to get that experiment run. And, uh, and second is maybe we're worried about what the result is going to look like. Uh, but that said, uh, uh, you know, your president just told me earlier that uh, Purdue has run such an experiment with uh, a, a on-campus traditional course, a blended course, and an online course. And, and, and uh, they have the results, and I'm looking forward to seeing that study. And so you have done it yourselves. And so, uh, I mean, again, you know, I'm really delighted uh, and excited coming here as to how far ahead uh, you are in terms of the thinking uh, in, in education. So edX and none of our partners have done that to my knowledge, but you have the results and so I'm looking forward to seeing the results. 
So next time I give a talk, I'm going to quote Purdue results if I can. It, it was interesting. Andy, in, in addition, was interested in wondering how longitudinally, uh, I think you were, uh, 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 graduates of your courses do in later years. Well, they've only been around such a short time. It's, uh, it's going to be a while. But, but I will point out that the Gallup-Purdue Index, which is in the field right now, uh, will, pr will produce exactly that sort of data. And it may be a couple, three years before his right. graduates are out and measurable, uh, but uh, it will be fascinating to know. There was another question right behind Andy, and then we'll, yes, ma'am. Oh, Gabriel. You know, I've, I planted this question in the audience. <laughs> no, I didn't. But uh, absolutely, but that's uh, an obvious next question, which is, you know, we have all this data. We have, all, we have courses using all methodologies. So I, I encourage you to go to edX, and, and you'll see some professors, you know, uh, tape themselves, you know, lecturing on a blackboard. Some of them, some people use uh, uh, Khan-style videos. How many of you have uh, looked at Khan Academy? Fantastic. So Sal Khan was my student, and uh, you know I've been inspired by him, and and the way he, he does videos with tablet capture, I call them Khan style KSVs or Khan style videos, and there are many many ways of capturing video. And so a natural question to ask is, you know, Anand, you have all of this data, all this big data, and you know how long students have engaged with the material, so you can check which one works. So uh, I'm almost wondering uh, whether I should give the result, but uh, but there's a paper. So on edX, what we did, again, as a nonprofit, believe it or not, we have a, a, a link on our, we have a portal on our site where it's called Research and Pedagogy. And there, people post papers on research that they've done using uh, MOOC data. And again, as a nonprofit, we do, we do crazy things like this, you know, post research results. Uh, when's the last time you've seen a for-profit do something like that? So we, we have that. So I would encourage you to go to edX, go to the Research and Pedagogy page, and in there, there's a paper uh, by uh, uh, several authors, I forget the title, answering exactly the question you asked. They looked at all different types of videos and uh, to look at which are the ones that are most engaging. Okay, I'll tell you the result. Uh, they, they actually found that uh, uh, the ones that recorded a professor teaching in the ba way back in the classroom are not um, are the least popular. Uh, the second ones are a professor uh, you know, recorded close up uh, in an uh, in uh, informal setting. Uh, the second most uh, popular, and the most popular are what I call the Khan style, uh, you know, very informal, scribbling on a piece of paper, the most popular. And the reason is students feel as if the professor sitting next to them uh, teaching on a piece of paper, much like a parent teaches a child. Very good. Um, last word. We're, we're lucky to have with us uh, uh, tonight the uh, chancellor of Indiana's community college, single community college, and all its uh, assistants. Tom Snyder's here, and the chancellor of WGU Indiana, Indiana's eight state university, I always said, online, fully online, competency-based, very innovative education, primarily aimed at older students. So please, the last question. The question is, uh, you know, um, uh, what excites me about the future and what's next in the space? <clears throat> I think what excite me, excites me about the future is that I have absolutely no idea what the future is going to look like. And that's why it's exciting. Yeah. You know, once you know what it's going to look like, it's boring. <laughs> but imagine going to a film where you know what the ending is. It's not fun. But in this case, frankly, now I've, been, I've been teaching for 26 <coughs> years. And uh, I have no idea what the future is going to look like. I think the university as we know it is going to transform itself. It's going to be different. And I think some of the classrooms I saw today it presages what uh, classrooms are going to look like. Uh, I've written about, uh, I've written in, in the Huffington Post about uh, university unbundled, where we need to uh, figure out, you know, anything we do in university has to pass, has to pass, uh, you know, President Daniels' pajama test. Otherwise, why do it? And so we need, and what are those things? We don't know the answer. So I think, I think the most exciting part of the future is the fact that we have no idea what the future is going to look like. Uh, what's next for edX? I think, uh, uh, you know, we are focusing on, uh, I think one of the things we're working pretty hard on is, uh, what is, uh, uh, how do we find a way to reward students? How do we work with universities and credentialing agencies to, uh, to give them something meaningful of value so they'll be motivated and take the test? And you, know, you mentioned competency-based. I think, I think that is a big one. And I think uh, 
we are collaborating with the college board and to see whether we can create exams or if we can create courses but have some other agency create competency tests so that you can now take a full MOOC course and then go and take a competency test some, by, given by somebody. Heck, edX could give a competency test. Uh, although that's not the business we are in, but ideally we'd, we'd like to have some, someone like College Board or, or someone such as yourself give a competency test and students can learn anywhere they want but go take a competency test. And, and the credential they get from there is the valued credential. So that, that might be one thing that would be very interesting going into in the future. So Dr. Agarwal, you are uh, uh, at once a brilliant person and an idealistic person, but uh, uh, on top of that, you are a highly practical and results-oriented person, and it's rare, uh, almost singular, to find that uh, in, in one uh, package. So uh, it's been a great privilege to have you here at Purdue. We see you as a, uh, both a teacher, but uh, also a, a, a very uh, a healthy a competitor and a prod to our own action, and we thank you for all of that. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you for uh, Thank you for having me. Thank you.